Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this webinar on the uh, Building Safety Act. My name is Stuart Pemble, and it's my privilege to chair this afternoon's webinar. Um, there will be an opportunity for questions at the end, but please do use the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen to ask those. Um, everyone on the panel today is acutely aware that we're presenting this webinar a week after Sir Martin Morbick's uh, final report on the Grenfell tragedy. And it's fair to say that we did wonder whether we should change what we were planning to say to actually consider uh, Sir Martin's report in more detail. But we felt it was better to deal with live issues that are affecting our clients in the industry now, uh, rather than indulge in some crystal ball gazing. Um, going forward, uh, we will be covering the changes uh, that are going to follow following uh, the report. And it's fair to say that um, the one thing that is certain following the report and following what the government has said in the light of it is that safety is going to continue to dominate everything that the government does in relation to um the Building Safety Act and making sure that the a dreadful tragedy like a dreadful doesn't happen again. So this afternoon, we're going to focus on a number of key issues that broadly speaking, we can fit into three categories, some which cover all buildings, some which relate to high risk buildings, and some which relate to relevant buildings. And the first of those is the new question of competence. And I think it's over to you, Ian, to start on that. Thank you, Stuart. Um, so as Stuart said, the first um, few areas we're going to cover relate to all buildings and specifically here, all buildings where the building regulations are engaged. So, the first issue we were going to touch on was competence for the building regulations principal designer and building regulations principal contractor roles. And we've used BRPD and BRPC as acronyms because it's important to remember that these roles are similar but separate from the same named roles under the CDM regulations. And so maintaining that separation is valuable. So what's changed? Well, we think that there is a much greater emphasis on the client requirement, the requirement on all clients to assess competence for the building regulations, principal designer and principal contractor role. So what are clients looking for? Well, and if you are a BRPD or a BRPC, what, what are you looking for? to demonstrate. And we think that the relevance of expertise and the relevance of experience is increasingly important. And this is always perhaps intended by the CDM, but the inclusion of these roles in the building regulations has brought it into sharp relief. We are lawyers. We don't get involved in the detail of actually assessing an individual or an organization's competence. And we found both the statutory and non-statutory guidance available very helpful. Um, that it includes the one that we've linked to from the slides, and that link will be live in the version of the presentation we share after the event. But the Association of Project Managers has produced very helpful guidance in that respect. So. This relates to all buildings, not just to HRBs. And our practical takeaways around best practice are that even though the obligation in statute to keep a written record of your competence checks only applies to higher risk buildings, which we'll come on to later, we think it's probably best practice to keep a written record of all your competence checks on all projects, not only for your own peace of mind, but also just in case something does go wrong or you need to double check what was or wasn't assessed if the project changes. And that 
obligation to keep competence under review is live and could form part of that written record as well. But I think I'm going to throw a tricky question now over to Dom. If there are these new roles of BRPD and PR, BRPC, what does it mean on a project where, on the face of it, you might want to subcontract those roles or transfer those roles down the supply chain? What does that mean in practice and what are our clients finding in practice there, Dom? Thanks, Ian. And as you say, it is a, it's a thorny one um, and something we've, we've been looking at in various contexts a uh, question really that arises from the fact that these new duty holder roles attach to the specific organisations and individuals that are obliged to discharge them. Um, so in relation to subcontracting, um, a duty holder can certainly engage third party expertise to help it meet its statutory duties. But that duty holder remains the statutory duty holder and cannot delegate the role. So the functions can be delegated to an extent through subcontracting, but the role itself and the obligation to discharge that role can't. And so I see this as one of the areas where the new regime necessitates behavioral change. It's not possible to simply pass all responsibilities down the supply chain by subcontracting them and washing your hands. Um, and one example of this is, is on commercial projects, it's incumbent on the client to appoint the BRPD and the BRPC, failing which it falls back to the client to discharge the duties required of those roles. And the prevailing view, which incidentally we agree follows from the wording of the relevant regulations, is that the client's obligation to appoint means that the client must appoint the PD and PC directly, as opposed to merely procuring that an appointment is made. So, for instance, it's not possible for the client to appoint a main contractor and then for that contractor to appoint the principal designer as a subconsultant. And that's consistent with the, the principle that all duty holders, the clients included, um, will be expected to take a, a close and active responsibility for ensuring that building works comply with the building regulations. Um, as a generality, the expectation is that it will be the lead designer that takes on the BRPD role and the main contractor that takes on the BRPC role. Um, and on design and build schemes, that logic leads to the position where the main contractor is likely to be best placed having full responsibility for design and construction to um, perform both the BRPD and BRPC roles. Now that's not to say that the main contractor must therefore be an expert in all design disciplines. It can um, and typically will need to demonstrate competence by showing that it has the organizational capability and expertise to coordinate inputs from the design team, to build consensus around design decisions, to ensure that the resulting design, if and when built, would satisfy the relevant requirements of the building regulations. And at that point, I'm gonna hand back to you, Ian, and to Lizzie to talk about um, enforcement. Thanks, Dom. So um, I get the easy job again on this one and handing over a, a question to Lizzie. But if you wouldn't mind, Lizzie, setting the scene on what um, building regulations enforcement tends to mean in practice and then what the key change in this area is. And I know that as part of that key change, you're going to ask the question that's on the slide, whether that change could take retrospective effect. Thank you. Yes. So we've just been talking about changes that are designed to ensure that things go right. Um, but the BSA has also brought in changes to deal with when things go wrong. So as some of you will know, um, local authorities have a number of options in their arsenal to enforce the breaches of building regulation. And one of the most commonly used options is a Section 36 notice under the Building Act, under which the local authority can require a building owner to remove or alter works carried out in breach of building regulations. 
Now, before the Building Safety Act came into effect, um, the local authority had 12 months within which to serve a Section 36 notice from completion of the offending works. Under the BSA, under the Building Safety Act, that period have, of enforcement has increased to 10 years. And I think the important thing to note there is it makes it much more likely that Section 36 notices can be served on building owners who were not the owners who originally instru instructed or commissioned the works that were carried out in breach. The really thorny issue, um, as Ian has alluded to, is whether that change is retrospective or not. And to make matters doubly complicated, the government has um, issued some commentary indicating that the changes are not retrospective, but that's not really borne out by the wording of the legislation itself. And in our view, and I think it's fair to say that this is echoed across the uh, legal sector at the moment, the wording of the legislation means that the change is retrospective unless uh, the local authority has already taken enforcement action. So what does that mean in practice? If I bought a building today, we think that if work was carried out, let's say eight years ago, and it was a substantial refurbishment and it was carried out in breach of building regulations, the local authority could now come after me in respect of that work. And in fact, they could come after me for a further two years and serve me with a section 36 notice. And that is a really profound and significant change. And it's going to change the way that we approach uh, investment in new builds and in buildings that have been subject to substantial works in the last 10 years. I think this is back to, to me, um, and I'm going to ask Alison to help me talk through the next few slides, which are looking at the processes for um, applying for approval from building control before starting works. Um, and we're going to carry on looking at non high risk buildings first and then move on to look at the, the, the situation in relation to high risk buildings. So where work is not in a higher risk building, the building control authority is either the local authority building control department or a private sector registered building control approver. That's a new title. The previous building control approved inspector role has been retired and the, the replacement, as its name suggests, um, must now be registered. So private building control approver must appear on the public register and the registration must cover the specific category of work that you're looking for that approver to be involved in. Um, and Alison, I think you're going to help talk through some of the notices requirements. Yes. For a non higher risk building, once you've got building control approval, there are two notices that you now need to serve at a relatively early stage of the project. The first notice has to be served um, with two working days before work starts. And rather unhelpfully, we don't have a definition of what is meant by starting work. Um, the closest we have is that the government issued a letter last October, which was updated in February, to the effect that they expect starting work to consist of the undertaking of any element of permanent notifiable building work as described in the applicant's application or initial notice. So to a large extent, starting work is going to be um, uh, governed by what you put in your application for building control approval. But it, it, it is going to mean the starting of work. The second notice has to be given no more than five days after work commenced. And for those of you that haven't spent the last six months with your head deep in the Building Safety Act and building regulations, you might wonder what the difference is between start and commence, because it doesn't appear obvious. Well, we do have a definition for, of commenced. Um, it's quite detailed. You can find it at Regulation 46A of the Building Regulations. And it's three tiered. It's what one um, definition applies to what are described as complex buildings, which are in themselves defined. 
Another definition relates to non-complex buildings, new builds um, or horizontal extensions. And the third definition relates to all other buildings, all other building work. Um, the first two definitions, as I say, are, are, are quite detailed, um, but they, they provide basically that the foundations and other uh, aspects of works will have been undertaken. The third definition is quite helpful because the third, it relates to the fact that it will be been 15% of the work that is intended to be undertaken has been undertaken. So you can see from that third definition that we're talking about a notice being served some considerable time after the works actually start. So to recap, two notices at the early stage of the work, one to be served when work start or within two working days of work starting, the second one to be served no more than five work, working days after work's commenced, but that is a much later stage in the project than when you start work. Fast forward to completion, and you need to serve another notice, a completion notice, no more than five days after the works are completed. There's a, a detailed requirement of what's required to be served with that completion notice, but we won't go into that today because it, it of itself could be a seminar all on its own. That's non-higher risk buildings. Turning to higher risk buildings, by way of a reminder, these are buildings that are 18 meters or seven stories in height and which contain two or more residential units. And hospitals and care homes during the con construction phase only, which meet the height requirement, they don't need to meet the two or more residential unit requirements. So in relation to those higher risk buildings, the building control approval process and the notices that have to be served is more complex. And Dom is going to run us through those. Yep, thanks, Alison. It's worth saying that that definition on the screen is correct um, as of today, um, but it's one area that is likely to be reviewed in light of the Grenfell Inquiry's phase two report. Um, so where you're talking about higher risk buildings, the Building Control Authority is now the new building safety regulator within the Health and Safety Executive. And the application for approval before work starts is referred to as Gateway 2. We'll touch more on what that entails on the next slide. But for now, from a process perspective, once you've approved, you've, you've got your approval at Gateway 2, we again see a notice before starting and one after commencing with the definitions and the considerations that Alison discussed previously applying here too. Um, three key differences to note when you're dealing with an HRB. First is that the pre-start notice for an HRB must be given five working days before start, as opposed to two working days. Second relates to change control. Um, and this is much more tightly uh, regulated, controlled in relation to HRBs. So major changes, and there's a, an exhaustive list of what constitutes a major change in the regulations, require an application to an approval from the regulator before implementing any of the work that relates to that proposed change. Um, and the statute gives the regulator six weeks to consider a major change application which will need to be factored into the programme impacts of any proposed change. Um, other changes that are not considered major may still require notification to the regulator if they, uh, if they constitute a notifiable change. Um, notifiable changes have to be notified but don't require approval before they're implemented. Um, and the third point to flag Third point of distinction is that instead of the completion notice that Alison mentioned, for HRBs, we have the Gateway 3 application to the regulator for a completion certificate. And um, that needs to be accompanied by a detailed pack of information about the completed works. And the significance of that certificate is that the HRB can't be registered and therefore can't be occupied without it. Um, now, I'd say that market practice is emerging around this point, but we're seeing and, and we see good sense in a contractual approach that makes obtaining the completion certificate from the regulator a condition to practical completion of the works. And with that, Alison, I'll pass back to you to look at the content of the Gateway 2 application in more detail. 
Yes, I, I, I guess this is because uh, it, it's inevitable in the way that the regulations have come into force. But we are seeing most of, of the queries that we're seeing at the moment relate to Gateway 2 applications. That's building control applications to the building safety regulator uh, for a high risk building. Um, the building safety regulator, in theory, at any event, has 12 weeks to decide whether to grant approval to an application for a new build, high risk building, and eight weeks to decide whether to grant approval for works to an existing high risk building. But um, last month in August, we saw a document produced by the Health and Safety Executive under which the Building Safety Regulator sits, which indicated that, in fact, it's taking the regulator between 12 and 18 weeks to reach decisions. It's not very clear whether that means that you get an extra um if you've got an existing building, it could go from being eight weeks to 18 weeks or how how they're working out that time frame. But what is clear is it's more than the 12 and eight weeks that they they had intended to to um, comply with in terms of giving approval or not. One of the points to note is that building work cannot start until approval has been given. And there are very, very limited ex exceptions to to that. Um, some specific exceptions are that you can apply, you can um, commence work before your application for uh, uh, building control approval has uh, been um, confirmed. If you have, if you're doing emergency repairs, remember, note though that it's emergency repairs and not emergency works. And our view is that this is a very, very limited exception. So it's best to be prudent and exercise caution when using that exception or indeed any of the others, which include the self-certification process. Dom, I think you have a few thoughts about the building work not being able to be started until approval yeah. is given. I, I was just going just going to, to mention that we've seen some confusion um, arising from um, the question, well, the, the wording of the regulations and whether that suggests that the scope of work that requires approval in an HRB is wider than for other buildings. Um, and we've had some help for clarification from the regulator, not in writing, unfortunately, but it was on a on a webinar that the, the regulator delivered. Um, and that clarified that the need for building control approval on an HRB arises in relation to building works um, the words you've got bold on the screen there, Alison, um, as defined in the building regulations, um, in the same way as, as, as has been the case in all buildings for the last 14 years. So that's a, a useful point of clarification. Mm. And I think our current thinking is that building work does not include demolition or some groundworks either. So, in fact, they it may be able to start that element of work before uh, obtaining approval. Um, all of this is uh, uh, an area of, uh, likely to cause confusion and the scratching of heads of anyone having to make an application. If you thought you would be able to get advice from the regulator as to how you would deal with the application, you will not. The regulator has made it very clear that it will not be providing advice and that you should be looking at your uh, professional advisors as to how to complete an application for Gateway 2. And, and linked with that, we have seen where there have been rejections by the regulator of applications that they're not even they're not, in that situation, they're not providing any further support as to why an application is being rejected, for instance, either. So that leaves us all looking at what, in fact, should be included. And the, the bottom of the, 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 the last screen and actually on the screen as well, there's a reference to the regulations that apply. Please don't be concerned about the amount of detail on this page. It's, it's, it's a guide to you all. We're not going to, to go through it all in detail. Points I would make are that be aware that regulation four of the procedure regulations applies to new builds, new HRBs, and regulation 12 applies to existing HRBs. There's a lot of information under both those regulations. We've condensed the key points on this slide, but but you should and must look at the actual regulations themselves when making an application to the building safety regulator. 
What we're going to talk about, though, is the points that we've highlighted in pink. So the first one that I, I wanted to mention is the uh, requirement for a statement to be included as to when works will be regarded as commenced or when uh, details of what is considered to be 15% of the, of the proposed works. So this goes back to the notice that I was talking about earlier, the, the, the requirement to serve a notice when works are commenced. In your application, you are giving the regulator the information so that it can work out for itself when you have commenced uh, the uh, when when works have commenced on your particular project so it's important you get that correct in the first place because it can come back to haunt you later on the other two documents we want to talk about are a declaration and a statement um in relation to the competence declaration I, we, we've seen quite a lot of issues in relation to this i think that's fair to say isn't it dom um don't know whether you want yeah. to talk through some of that yeah i mean so the there's a an exhaustive list of what has to be included in this competence declaration and it's a it's a relatively detailed statement that needs to be signed by the client um setting out that uh, the client having um taken reasonable steps has satisfied itself that the duty holders it has appointed at the date of the application are competent um the client also has to confirm that it has um inquired as to whether the duty holders are subject to any serious sanction for breach of the regulations in the past five years uh, or guilty of any other misconduct, which incidentally is, is not defined. Um, and then if there has been a serious sanction or any relevant misconduct, um, an explanation as to why the client um, considers it remains appropriate to appoint those entities. Um, and one reflection here is that in the applications that we've seen that have been accepted by the regulator, the, the competence declaration has taken quite a, a formulaic approach to setting out each piece of information that is required by the regulations to make the job of the, the person reviewing at the regulator as easy as possible. Um, and the other thing I'll just mention briefly is that um, that competence declaration needs to be accompanied by the written records of the steps taken to check the competence of the BRPD and the BRPC at the time that those duty holders were appointed. Now, the content of those written records may well overlap to an extent with what needs to go into the competence declaration, but it is, on our reading at least, very clear that those are two separate documents and the competence declaration um, anticipates appending or enclosing the written records that have been produced previously. Yes, thanks, Dom. And the second second um, statement stroke declaration we wanted to mention was the building regulations compliance statement. And this is a statement uh, setting out the approach and the reasoning for the design of each element of the building. Um, this is therefore going to be quite a detailed document. You're going to need your technical advisors to support you in relation to this document. Um, it's not something that lawyers will be able to advise you on in the same way as we can advise you in relation to the competence declaration, although we can give you an overall uh, uh, advice as to whether we think it's in the, in the right ballpark or not. Interestingly, the competence declaration needs to be signed, but the compliance statement doesn't need to be signed but it is our view that it, it's wise to, to ensure that both are signed. There's no harm in having both signed before you submit your application for building control approval. So that's what you have to do. What happens next? Well, if you don't provide all the information required, then um, the building safety regulator will reject your application. And uh, it's it's fair to say that we're seeing numerous uh, applications being rejected at this stage. I think that's fair, isn't it, Dom? And it's taking some time for things to get get through it's gateway two. Yeah, I think I think that is fair, Alison. I mean, an anecdotally, that seems to be a function of a degree of inexperience on the side of industry paired with um capacity constraints at the regulator so if there is a, a a reason an easy reason to reject then um the regulator may well take that opportunity 
which means the message really is to to make sure you're taking a thorough approach to ensuring that all of the necessary information is included in the application. Um, and where that is the case, we are starting to see a, a wave, small wave of applications that have been accepted for processing by the regulator. Which leads us on to something entirely different but related, independent sections. And I think we're going to hear from Lizzie and Ian on this. Thanks, Alison. Yeah. Um, again, I, I think I've said this for the third time now. I must have done something right in a past life, but I get the easy job. And here's my summary of what we mean by independent sections. And then to try and bring it to life. So as you're listening to my explanation, know that Lizzie's going to follow up with a worked example that we've come up with um, to try and bring what I've got to say to life. So what do we mean by an independent section? Again, we're talking about higher risk buildings. And um, in the context of higher risk buildings, an independent section is a part of a structure or part of a set of structures which has separate day-to-day -day access and no shared day-to-day -day access and there's a detailed statutory definition as there is of so many of these things that we're talking about today. If you have an independent section, what's the impact of that? Well, that section is treated as a separate building, uh, which itself may then not be an HRB, depending on its height and use. It is possible to have two independent sections, both of which are HRBs, um, but the uh, examples where perhaps some of the tricky questions arise seem to us to relate to those where the independent section that is treated as, as a building is not then itself an HRB. There is government guidance on this. Again, a link will follow. Um, and that does include some useful pictures and some useful examples. So why are we talking about it today? Well, we think there are perhaps two key legal issues that do create multiple practical issues for us all on the projects that we're actually working on. The first is, well, exactly when do independent section rules apply? It's clear that they don't apply during ground up construction of or conversion to an HRB. So during the construction phase of a new build HRB, you can't have an independent section under this legislation. Um, they do apply during the occupation phase of an HRB. So for example, there's no principal accountable person for an independent section during that occupation phase. And they certainly appear to apply during works to an existing HRB, but exactly what that means is unclear. And that leads to the second question, what is the extent exactly of an independent section? For example, is the structure around an independent section included? And we think at the moment, although we've guided clients through these tricky waters, there is no clear answer in the BSA, and we would love there to be some judicial guidance. And in the absence of that, um, I'm going to ask Lizzie to walk you through an example and then some of the practicalities that follow from that example. Thanks, Ian. Yes, yeah, so this is taken from some real life um, situations that we've had to advise on. Um, and we're going to look at a really common type of high rise building um, to try and put this into focus. And one which for those of you who operate in the Manchester and London markets, you're likely to be particularly familiar with. So let's assume we've got a residential high rise um, with some ground floor retail. We've basically got a block which is a resi block, but there is a shop on the ground floor. And let's assume, as is often the case, that the residential elements of the building have a ground floor access, which is only for the use of the residential occupiers of the building, leading onto a lobby with lifts and internal staircases to the flats above. And at the same time that the shop has its own access for customers directly off the street, and perhaps that it has access for staff and for servicing at the rear, which is also uh, only for the use of the shop unit. 
Now, ostensibly here, we have got an independent section. The shop is an independent section because it has independent access and it doesn't share day-to-day -day access with the residential elements of the building. So we've got a higher risk building in, in the residential elements of this structure and we've got an independent section, which is the shop. Now, let's assume that uh, the tenant of the shop has vacated, the building owner, the landlord wants to relet, it's got interest from a retail, uh, from a restaurant um, operator um, who wants to come in and convert the shop to a, a sort of high end restaurant. I think you can all see where we're going with this. So the conversion of a shop to a restaurant is necessarily going to involve some fairly significant works. In this case, we're going to assume it's going to involve structural works. The uh, restaurant operator is going to have to drill into the external walls to install extraction fans and extraction units. And they're going to be installing a whole load of um, cooking equipment, and um, which is going to change the fire risk profile of the overarching structure of the whole of the HRB as well as the independent section. Now, if we're the tenant here or we're part of the tenant's project team, the key question is, in doing this fit out, in doing these conversion works, are we going to have to go through the gateways? Is the regulator our building control authority for these works? And that in turn depends on whether or not we are doing works to an independent section, in which case, we're not going through the gateways, or whether we're doing works to a high-risk building. And that question is actually really difficult to answer, as Ian has alluded to, because it's not clear if the structure around an independent section is included within the independent section. If it is, if the structure is part of the independent section, then in doing works to the structure, we're not doing works to the HRB, we're still doing works to the independent section. But if it's not, as soon as we step outside the internal envelope of that shop unit, then we're doing works to an HRB and we may need to go through the gateways unless some of the very limited exemptions that John and Alison talked about apply. So the tenant has um, a problem because it's difficult to identify whether or not it should be going through the gateways. The landlord, the building owner also has a problem and that's really because, practically speaking, whether or not these are works to an HRB or to an independent section from a technical legal perspective, practically, these works are going to have a major impact on the HRB. If we are doing structural works to the ground floor of the building, clearly that could have a structural impact and create structural risks in relation to the remainder of the building above it. And of course, if we're installing a whole load of kitchen equipment, deep flat fryers and so on, we are going to be changing the fire risk profile of the building. There is an increased fire risk as a result of the use of the independent section, which wasn't there when it was used as a shop. And I think that really highlights a wider issue with this notion of independent sections, um, that it's very difficult to horizontally divide up a tool structure. And it perhaps doesn't make sense from a safety perspective to do so. So we think this could be an area that's ripe for some uh, legislative amendment. So what does this all mean in practice? Well, I think if you're if you're on the tenant side or if you're on the uh, project team for the tenant, um, you're going to need to take a cautious view if you are doing anything more than minor works. And the the sensible approach as things stand is to engage early with the regulator and to approach the regulator as if a uh, gateway sign off is going to be required and then it's for the regulator to say actually you fall outside the regime albeit that as Alison has indicated you know anecdotally the, the regulator is very reluctant to give any form of advice and and does tend to be batting things back um, to the clients at the moment. On the uh, landlord side, on the building owner side, um, we think that landlords, building owners, authorising tenants in mixed use uh, blocks, commercial tenants to do works, should be seeking enhanced controls and protections in relation to those works. And that is because of that point I made earlier, which is the works are likely to have an impact on the wider building, even if they can't technically be conceived as works to a high risk building. And if the landlord is the 
principal accountable person for the building or an accountable person for the building, they have statutory duties under the VSA, as I'm sure you all know, to, to effectively ensure building safety. So those duties are going to be impacted by what the tenant's doing. So a higher degree of control and a greater information flow is going to be required in relation to those works. Thanks, Lizzie. And um, if that wasn't complicated enough, then um, the final couple of um, slides we wanted to take you through now move into the world of the relevant building. So as Stuart set out at the start, we have gone from all buildings where the building regulations are engaged to um, a subset of those buildings that are the higher risk buildings. But we're now in a slightly different world, which stands apart from that regime, the regime of relevant buildings. So a higher risk building may also be a relevant building, but relevant buildings are separate. And it's really helpful for you all to keep that definition in mind, but keep it separate from what we've been talking about. And a relevant building is a building that is more than 11 meters or five stories high and um, contains two or more dwellings. And this is uh, a definition that is used in the realm of engagement with tenants in the, in the, the realm of um, remedying um, building safety issues in a subset of uh, buildings that is wider than higher risk buildings. Um, so without further ado, I'm handing you back to Lizzie, who's going to take you through um, something we don't think has had much attention to date, and that is these leaseholder protections information regulations. Okay, so as Ian said, it is really vitally important. It's a mistake I see quite often to keep the higher risk building regime and the relevant building regime separate. And the higher risk building regime is really about control controlling the construction of resi and mixed use high rises and controlling their occupation going forwards prospectively. The relevant building regime, exactly as Ian has said, is about allocating cost for remediating defects at relevant buildings, medium rise resi and mixed use buildings, which create um, fire or structural safety risks. And I'm going to call those as the as the BSA itself does relevant defects for the purposes of this slide. OK, so um, I want to talk about one aspect of the relevant building regime very briefly. And to understand that, I just want to remind you all that the centrepiece of the relevant building regime is the idea that occupational tenants particularly residential tenants, should not be paying for the cost of remediating relevant buildings. So the Building Safety Act creates a whole load of tenant protections against landlords passing through via the service charge their costs of remediating relevant defects. However, the Act gives landlords in this situation where they're remediating a relevant defect and they can't charge their occupational tenants various other avenues to pursue and one of those avenues is quite a well-known route and has received quite a lot of attention and that's the remediation contribution order and under remediation contribution order as some of you will know um a current landlord can pursue another landlord of the building current certain former landlords of the building and the developer of the building and their associate for a contribution towards their remediation costs however under these regulations that are up on the slide there, there is a second option for landlords. And that is something that has not received, as Ian said, very much um, commentary or judicial treatment so far. And that option is an option to what I'm going to call a top-up notice. And essentially, a, a landlord who hasn't been able to get full service charge recovery because of the operation of these tenant protections can serve notice on certain other current and former owners of the relevant building, effectively requiring them to top up the irrecoverable service charge costs. Now, why does that matter? Well, it matters because to some extent, these, these top up notices can be wider than remediation contribution orders, which would receive much more attention. And that's for a number of reasons. Um, the first is that a remediation contribution order can only be made against a corporate entity. 
But these top-up notices can be issued to individuals. Um, the second reason that it's important, and the second reason why to some extent they are wider than RCOs, is that the, the category of former landlords who can be served with a top-up notice is wider than the category of former landlords who can be uh, who can have a remediation contribution order made against them. And the third, and I think the most important point here, is that remediation contribution orders are subject to a test of justice and equitability. In other words, the tribunal has to think that it is fair to impose a remediation contribution order on a corporate entity. There is no such test in relation to these top-up notices. So there's not a question of fairness. It doesn't matter if it's not fair. It doesn't matter if the landlord who served with the notice had nothing to do with the works that created the relevant defect. It doesn't matter that they didn't satisfy a, a wealth test that can increase the level of tenant protection available. None of that matters. The only two questions are, has the current landlord suffered irrecoverable service charge as a result of the operation of the tenant protections? Yes. And is the landlord who's been served with the notice in the basket of landlords who can be served? And if the answer to those two questions is yes, then that landlord can be required to top up, even if it doesn't seem fair. So I think that's really important. It's important if we are involved with or acting for, or we are a landlord of a relevant building and we're having to remediate and we're suffering irrecoverable service charge because it gives us another weapon in our arsenal of who else could we, who else could we look at to recover from. But it's also very important if we are an investor in these types of properties in relevant buildings, because it means there is a, an additional new potential liability that goes with that ownership. And critically, that we don't get rid of when we sell on the asset. Thanks, Lizzie. Thanks, Lizzie. I'm going to deal with the final point which is also to do with relevant buildings, um, remediation orders. Now, they've been around for some time. Um, they relate to relevant buildings. They enable certain entities, including the Secretary of State, to seek an order against the landlord to deal with, to rectify um, any risk, to, uh, a building safety risk being a, a risk to the safety of people as a result of the spread of fire or the collapse of a building, as in relation to defects that occurred in the period June 1992 to June 2022. And we have seen some of these orders already being made, but the, the purpose of this slide is just to, to, to give you a, a taste of the last two orders that were made. One in relation to Vista Tower Stevenage, which was made on the 29th of April this year, and a couple of weeks later, one made in relation to the chocolate box at Bournemouth. In both cases, the orders were sought by the Secretary of State. In both cases, the respondent was not the developer and had purchased the relevant building after the Grenfell fire. In both cases, works had started, but despite that, the mediation orders were made. I think the point to take away from this is, uh, is fairly straightforward and simple. Secretary of State, is clearly flexing its muscles, but even before the last general election, as a result of the Grenfell inquiry, I think we can expect them to do so, to use remediation orders even more. Um, and note the fact that works had already started did not prevent a remediation order being made. Um, so it will be clearly used, I think, by the Secretary of State to force progress of works on a, a defective buildings more quickly than perhaps has happened to date. A salutary note to end with. Stuart. Uh, thanks very much. I'm, I'm, I'm going to want to come back to you just maybe to touch on Grenfell, the consequences, but we have got some questions. Uh, Dom, I think he's been typing an answer to one of them. It might be simple for him to answer two linked questions. If we don't receive a response to the change submitted in the six week frame, time frame, do we assume approval and progress? And is it different if it's practical completion? And Dom, I think the answer in both cases is no, you don't. Yeah, I think think that that's right. I mean, 
so the the wording of the regulations in relation to the change control um process is is um slightly more forceful and um, they say the regulator must determine an application within six weeks or such longer period um, as may be agreed at any time between the regulator and the applicant um so that to me recognizes that there's going to be an impact on bill programs that needs to be kept to a minimum but the wording does stop short of saying if there's not a response within the six weeks, then you, you get a deemed approval. Um, and I think it's interesting that that longer period can be agreed at any time. Um, we haven't yet seen in practice whether extensions to the time period are going to be um, are going to become common or the circumstances in which they'll be requested or, 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 or required. Um, so I think the short answer is there's, it's not a deemed approval. Um, the, the six week period can be extended um, and uh, I, I think it would be dangerous to assume an approval. Thanks very much. Um, um, a question, would it be a wide approach to incorporate the principles for high risk building requirements in all projects that fall outside the high risk building height spe specification where the building regs apply? Well, the building regs apply to everything, don't they? So, unless I've misunderstood i think the, um that the, question Stuart, is is the is if I, I i got asked this by a client um and i think it's a sort of question around best practice and how we've been framing some of this so is it best practice to take some of the extras that are required from an hrb and apply it to everything and i think my answer is if there's or well, my suggestion because it's not necessarily a legal question is if you are working on a building where to take um, the thrust of, a, of another question, you know that there are vulnerable occupants, even though it doesn't meet the definition of HRB at the moment, one of the things you could do as a project team is consider what extra documents, what extra information, what extra planning would be required to meet the requirements of an HRB and apply those elements to your project. And the advantage of that might be if it's really helpful for your project, it saves starting from scratch and having to invent the wheel for your own project. You can rely on some of the guidance that's been published by the government and by other interested organizations and adapt it for your own project's use. So my off the cuff response in a similar way to I gave a client uh, today is, I think it's an opportunity for projects to adopt best practice from the HRB world, where that would help deliver a non-HRB project even more effectively. Thank you. And as a follow-up question, have we got any indication what other buildings will be included as HRBs going forward following Grenfell? And is, is the generic answer on that um, things where, where people might be at danger? Well, yeah, I think uh, as um, Lizzie and I alluded to, we wonder, there was nothing specific in the report on independent sections that I've been able to find, whether independent sections warrants another look um, and the vulnerable people was specifically flagged. And before, the, I think it was the day before the Grenfell report was published, the government did indicate its intention to bring in one of the recommendations from the Hackett review that wasn't previously implemented, and that is personal emergency evacuation plans. Thanks so much. We have a question of, is the whole recording going to be available to everyone? Yes, even if you arrive late, we don't, our technology doesn't cut you off based on uh, uh, the, the time that you arrive. So you, you will get you will get everything. Um, who within the BRPC should sign the compliance declaration? Do we? Um, I can say something about that and maybe Alison can, can pick up um, the follow up. Uh, the compliance declaration needs to be signed by the clients. The one, the document we were talking about is the compliance declaration. Um, so that's the the short answer. Um, the the gateway to application can uh, and and the, the inf information that goes into that can be prepared by um, duty holders and by others on, be on behalf of the client, and the client then needs to um, be satisfied that the information contained is accurate. Um, but there is a, a linked point, and I'm straying into the things that Alison was going to, to talk about anyway, around um, whether when, when the uh, BRPD and BRPC are giving um, the declarations that they need to give, who uh, ought to sign there. And there's a, a suggestion, I think, about, a, about specifying who needs to do that. Is that fair to say, Alison? 
Um, yes, I think um, as part of the um, compliance statement, you might expect you will expect a statement from the uh, the uh, BRPD and the PR BR. PC, if there is one. Um, it doesn't state who needs to sign it, but as one of the Grenfell recommendations, um, there is a suggestion, well, more than a suggestion, one of the recommendations is that uh, um, when you apply for building control approval, not necessarily as part of your compliance statement, there's, but th th there should be a statement from a senior manager of the principal designer. Uh, so it's got to be a specific senior person that all reasonable steps have been taken to ensure that on completion, the building as designed will be safe as is required by the building regulations. Um, and that in relation to the, um, the contractor, that, um, that the building control approval application is supported by a person a personal undertaking from the contractor, from a director or senior manager of the contractor, to take all reasonable care to ensure that on completion and handover, the building is as safe as is required by building regulations. So it's really requiring individuals to put put uh, their money where their mouth is. So um, forcing people to perhaps think about it a bit more carefully when they they are personally signing off these. These, these sorts of statements. Well, that, that's the recommendation, one of the recommendations from Grenfell. Thanks very much, um, Alison. Um, Lizzie, you're in the process, it says, of typing an answer to the question on um, are enforcement proceedings being retrospective? Is it, e is it easier for you to give a quick answer now? I'm conscious of time. Where... Yes, yes, sure. Um, so we've been asked um, where the ambiguity is uh, uh, as Stuart said, around whether or not the new 10-year enforcement period is retrospective. So um, we have some transitional provisions which bring into force the section of the Building Safety Act that amends Section 36 of the Building Act. And those transitional provisions are, unfortunately, the snappily titled the Building Safety Act 2022, Commencement Number 5, and Transitional Provisions, Regulations 2023. Don't worry, we can we can send this out afterwards. And essentially those say that notwithstanding the commencement of the section in the BSA that amends section 36, and here I'll quote, section 36 of the 1984 Act continues to apply as that provision had effect immediately before the 1st of October, 2023, in relation to any notice given by a local authority under section 36 of the 1984 Act before that date. So, as we read that provision, what it means is the old period of 12 months continues to apply only if the local authority has intervened prior to the 1st of October 2023. So logically, the new period of 10 years applies to um, all buildings whenever constructed or refurbished, unless those buildings are already under notice. So the new regime has retrospective effect and the 10 year enforcement period applies unless enforcement is already underway, in which case it's dealt with pursuant to the previous regime. Um, mm -hmm. So not the easiest to kind of work your way through, but I, I think actually the, the statutory wording is, as far as it can be, relatively clear. And that's why the guidance that we mentioned in the slide talking about enforcement periods is so odd because it does seem to be at odds with the strict wording of the statute. But thanks. I mean, I think when you say that the, the guidance is relatively clear, relative is, is, is a sort of relative concept, isn't it? In the, in the, in the, um, in the is, context it, of the Building Safety Act, okay. it's relatively clear. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, very quickly, Alison, uh, we're, 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 we're conscious of time. Just your, your immediate thoughts on Sir Martin Morbick's report, please. I mean, what do you think the, the initial takeaways that we should all have from it are? Well, the initial takeaways that I took from it, apart from what I've just spoken about in relation to uh, a statement from the senior manager of the principal designer and the director or senior manager of the principal contractor given a personal undertaking, the other key points were one that we've touched on already, which is the the definition of high risk buildings. And these the um, reports said that there should be an urgent review of the definition of high risk building because it was concerned it was concentrating on height, and it should look more particularly at the likely presence of vulnerable people for whom 
evacuation in the event of fire or another emergency would cause difficulty. So we might see a lower level of height requirement for things like care homes and hospitals. Um, I think that's almost certain to happen and happen quite quickly. Um, and the other quite interesting thing is the suggestion, well, there will the, the recommendation that there should be a construct construction regulator and that that construction regulator should operate a licensing scheme. Um, the implication being that only contractors who uh, were uh, are, are, were authorised under that scheme would be allowed to undertake work on higher risk buildings. Uh, Thanks very much, and thanks to everyone uh, for, for attending your participation. Thanks to my brilliant team of experts for, for their presentations, for answering questions so well. Um, there will be, when you leave, uh, an opportunity to give feedback. Please, please do do that. And on the web, on the page in front of you now, um, there's been, there are links to both our practical completion blog and our LinkedIn group. Um, Many, many thanks for taking out your your uh, taking your time today. It's a complicated and difficult and confusing world out there, and I'm afraid to say, if, I, if Alison was looking into her crystal ball, she's just going to tell you it's going to get more confusing and more complicated. Uh, over, uh, perhaps in, in about six months' time, we will keep everything updated uh, as we can. The blogs on practical completion and on our LinkedIn page, and so uh, expect to hear more from us as and when things change. Many thanks and goodbye.